Okay, uh, Sujit. What effect can being in a men's group have on a man's love relationship? Mm. A lot. A lot. It is uh, the much needed clarity, vigor, um, all of that men can receive from a men's group. Um, a lot of men I know who are so devoted, so dedicated to their families, they work very long hours, they work very hard uh, to give the best they can to their families. So that would be 40, 60 hours a week, easily. In the midst of all of that, they find very little time to really go inwards, to understand their challenges, uh, the divisions that they experience inside, um, the questions that they are grappling with that uh, they are unable to answer. For all of this, uh, brotherhood can be very, very helpful. Um, I'm pretty old-fashioned in the sense uh, I recognize that um, we have such an important role as men to play in helping the women in our lives be themselves. Not being trapped in um, these uh, norms around um, how they are expected to imitate others and often wrong examples, but just be themselves. And uh, it's one of the things that I notice about men who are uh, part of a good men's group and who show up in fierce authenticity is they acquire this mountain-like quality. Um, this kind of groundedness, this stability um, in their relationships. They show up as a mountain um, in the lives of the women and children in their lives. And um, that is such an important contribution that we as mature men can offer to our homes, our beloved ones, the women, society in general, our workplace. And, um, you know, there is this, this beautiful saying from our uh, tradition. Man must be the mountain so that she can flow like the river, rage like the wind, pour like the rain, and float like the cloud. And that is such a, a powerful reminder of how multidimensional the nature of the feminine is. And the joy that comes out of that dance of being that river, that rain, that wind, that cloud, that is possible. A woman is, is able to embody that only when we can show up as that mountain with that, that groundedness, that stability, that clarity, that patience, all of that. And that is again something that can uh, tremendously be cultivated uh, when we have a good uh, a group of awakened men around us. A group of awakened men, but why only men? Mm. Great question. Great question. Um, 
there is a part of our work like it or not uh, Tristan as men there is a part of our work that we can complete only in the counsel of other men because a part of our own inner work our healing our liberation is that work involving altering our relationship our inner relationship to the feminine whether it is something that we've inherited from our mothers or our former romantic partners doesn't matter a part of the work we have to do we must complete inner work we must complete is the work that relates to our relationship with the feminine and that work in its true openness in its full honesty can be done can be completed only in the counsel of other men who are on a similar journey so in my tradition there is tremendous openness for men and women to practice together a lot of the practice work is done together but there is this very crucial very foundational piece of our work our practice we can continue that only in the counsel of other men and this work practice is pretty central into what you teach men yes why uh, if i've understood your question correctly tristan um in our tradition we don't do a lot of work at the at the intellectual level um our practices are much more uh, ritualistic it's much more practical um and there is an important foundation there um something that a uh, western sage albert einstein said um we cannot solve a problem at the same level of consciousness at which the problem exists which is very true for us it's very very true it's very foundational that any problem that we are facing in our life for us to address that to approach that to solve that to fix that we must step into uh, uh an altered state of awareness and that is where the power of practice or rituals come in um rituals when we do them right they take us to altered states and it is in those states that we experience some of the most powerful breakthroughs so um there is a heavy emphasis on the practice and very little emphasis on um intellectual examination now when you say a powerful breakthrough these are profound things you are describing besides moving away from intellectualization what would you say are the elements of a good men's group to not stay at the surface but to actually go a bit deeper. Mm. Mm. It's a great question actually. Um um as you know you've joined me in practice uh quite a few times so you see the emphasis I put on the the practices, the rituals, the ceremonies. Um the processes the exercises uh play fun you know these are uh fundamental to men's group not just men's groups but also sisterhoods for women the play the song the dance the art you know that's all play in a, in the sisterhood um everything that we do together the play the fun that's a very important part of our togetherness 
a yeah, men's group is not meant to be a very somber dull experience it is um this vibrant lively brotherly thing so fun and play comes to me um yeah practices we've spoken about that those are a couple of things coming to me at this moment if we look up what love or compassion means in the dictionary mm. are there parts missing there that are perhaps not regarded valuable enough um missing where in in when when we speak of what is love what is compassion mm. what is caring for each other mm. if we ask these people here they probably will come up with a lot of feminine mm. qualities mm. is there a way that i can be loving towards you mm. that is of a totally different type mm. that is more masculine oh you know absolutely you know that love that togetherness that connection um that being for each other the care that is fundamental to to all of life isn't it in men's group you know the retreats that we practice together look at the amount of love that is existing there the togetherness and and for many of these men i mean if you if you look at the retreat that we just uh, experienced together you know there is a deep deep longing to experience that love and togetherness and brotherhood and caring and sharing all of that yet some of them are so conditioned blocked from all of that and once they realize it is a natural longing for each one of us um it is once they realize that each one of us you know just by unblocking ourselves we are all capable of in a very non sexual way in a in a very authentic way uh, be in each other's life um sharing and caring and and exchanging love that is such a natural experience and so connecting that back to brotherhoods um i have been witness to so many brotherhoods and so many men who have actually um regained their capacity for love compassion caring sharing uh even physical touch connection through brotherhoods um massive life altering breakthroughs just around these simple things simple things of how we can show up um in our wholeness in our relationship with women children other men uh in our workplace etc powerful breakthroughs men's group also a good place to learn how to face fear in a different way. Uh absolutely every every single bit every bit. In fact I would I would say if I would have to point out the two greatest demons that men come with into a men's group most men based on my experience 30 years now in this work four continents uh it's fear and anger um we are all containers of it we all carry a good dosage of fear and anger men in particular and uh being able 
to confront that, to reconnect with that in the safety of a men's group. And you've noticed how openly, how uh, boldly men reconnect with their fear and anger in men's groups. And see the power of that healing, the kind of release, freedom that they experience. And, and suddenly you start noticing how the same men who come into these experiences, uh, you know, uh, taking a vow that I'll never forgive her. Once they have uh, reconnected with that fear, that anger, released it, etc., you notice how effortlessly they, uh, they are able to uh, find compassion and understanding for men and women from their past, to make peace with old wounds. It is uh, fear and anger, uh, two of the most uh, the greatest demons that they come up with. They, they show up in a men's group with. Now, without uh, revealing any uh, personal details about the men that we just spent a weekend with, mm. uh, any transformation that you think being surrounded by a group of men has been instrumental for? You mean for any of the participants? Yeah. Yeah, or just um, do we want to go? Oh well, yeah, but it, there was a sign that said we have to be in the left line. Oh yeah. Uh, oh oh, uh, oh. It's, uh, We have a reservation. Okay, you're gonna go right behind the Dodge, please. All right. Okay. Thank you. What was the question? Uh, Any transformation that you witnessed in the men this weekend hmm. that you found particularly notable? Oh yeah, yeah, yes, many. But just to point out, one of the elders in this group, remember his sharing, his breakthrough, that uh, he could never trust men before. He could never see himself associate with men. His life, his social circle has all been women because it is with them that he felt safe. And three days later, he's saying like uh, the ultimate experience that he's experiencing is one of this togetherness with men. For somebody to come from such a distance, to a place of feeling this incredible sense of oneness with other men, just in three days. I found that to be a powerful breakthrough. Um, there was uh, this other very young fellow who, uh, who came in, in his life, not Thank you. And remember that uh, one. Okay. Uh, two, okay. Um, remember that uh, one of the, the the youngest fellows, perhaps the youngest fellow, in this group. Remember, uh, he uh, he came in. Um, he never had his father in his life growing up. Totally confused about himself and how um, he can show up in the lives of the women in his life. Um, very confused about his own energy. Very confronted about being himself. And spending three days in the council of another 20 men seeing each one of them just being their own natural selves. See the kind of confidence he got about just being himself. Like 
the 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 sharing the final sharing he made was like um, uh, my greatest responsibility is to show up authentically as who i am sometimes that will feel confrontational for some there might be pushbacks but he feeling like he is doing justice to himself and to others by showing up as who he truly is to come to that realization in just 3 days a man who grew up a young man who grew up his entire life without a father and in 3 days being able to come to that level of comfort with himself his own masculine essence that is isn't that a breakthrough okay let's do this first let's do it oh no there's no no there's no payment right Yeah, but we just need to uh, confirm. Uh, Hi. Hi. We have a reservation. Okay. Uh, name, phone number, confirmation. Confirmation number is one two two one three nine seven five two eight dash one. Uh, just to let you know we are about 25 minutes behind right now. Okay. Thank you. Get you into lane 11 there. Please. Thank you. Thank you. 25 minutes delay. Okay. Lane 11. So, it's out there way over there. What are some of the blessings that older men can give? younger men. Mm. And what does that really mean? <sighs> Good question. I know that in this part of the world uh age is not given due consideration. I know that. Um where I come from in my land uh aging is such an exciting thing for people you know people can't wait to grow old they are dying to grow old because you know whether we are aware of it or not um when we've lived through all those years of good experiences and bad experiences etc there is a level of richness it creates in our life and uh, you know i'm not saying that we should simply blindly adopt um the lessons from their lives but understanding the equity of that life experience you know when we are confronted by their experiences or their lessons you know it it's very valuable what happens is um it gives us a sense of what's right for us maybe their experience might not be right for us but still uh it gives us plenty of insights so life experience is um uh, it's a valuable input and then again you know like many people that i i meet uh in this land for example who who truly believe you know these are men and women that i meet that you know what um i have to go through this experience myself leave me alone really and uh, that makes me wonder like you know wait a minute can we learn only from our own experiences 
because that is contrary to everything that I've grown up with. And if I look at my life, I am unhesitating in saying that um, most of the lessons I've gained in my life are not through my life experience. They are from the experiences of my parents and other elders and my teachers and the masters and all that. And this would be true for all human beings. That most of the lessons that we have in our life, they are not from our own life experiences. That is where life experience, you know, we are not isolated beings. We are not individuals like uh, 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 an isolated island on an ocean. Even that island is connected to this whole under the same earth. We are part of that one. And um, uh, anybody's age is our wisdom. But that involves us recognizing that any life experience is life experience for all of us. So um, when, you, when you understand that, you start understanding the virtue of aging. And that also probably explains why in my, in my civilization, in my culture, people can't wait to get, grow old. Because it's kind of like they receive respect. They are, their wisdom is recognized. They are seen for the life journey that they've undertaken. So uh, it just gets better. Not to mention how we feel uh, internally as we grow old. I mean, if we've lived a, a rich life, a good life, the older we, and I look at my own life and I see, like compared to when I was 25 and now, I'm a much more content, much more self-aware, much more grounded human being. Age. Just the journey of life. What is respect? Ooh. Wow. You know, first, first thing that's coming to me is respect is not something that's forced. It is inspired. It is my spirit recognizing itself in the grandness of the other that is respect there's an awe that comes out of it like wow look at um, the bigness of her life and there is this recognition that uh, happens uh, where my soul recognizes that greatness that is for me respect. That's for me like me feeling like, wow, what a human being. A soul with greatness. A soul recognizing greatness. In another soul. Yeah. And then a men's group is one of the hmm. places where you can grow your soul. I love that connection you're making, you know, it's, uh, I mean, the soul is always there. It's more than growing that soul. It is a process of uncovering that soul. In, inside all that debris of life, of the wounds and the conditioning and the emotions and the feelings and the fear and um, all that conditioning underneath all of that. We still have that shining soul. It just needs to be dusted off and, and, and given space to shine. And absolutely, great point. Absolutely, you know. Um, men's group, good men's groups are such powerful uh, resources for that, that dusting, dusting off, uh, of releasing, liberating that soul very much.
You are a proponent for rituals. Mm. And I assume that if I ask you what is the point of these rituals, I think you will say that dusting off the soul is one of the, the outcomes of mm. those rituals. Are there other points of doing rituals? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very much. Um, the, uh, there is some very advanced science to rituals. But then, where most people get rituals wrong is in not understanding that science. Um, rituals are extremely powerful mechanisms of manifestation, of manifesting anything. You say, um, I'm a smoker and I'm done with smoking, I want to get out of it. Manifesting that reality. Good. You say, you know, I'm financially unhealthy. I'm poor. And um, I want to attract financial abundance into my life. Rituals, extremely powerful. Rituals are portals of moving just a simple thought into uh, a manifestation but then we need to do the rituals in the right way that means um, suppose you say um, I want to get out of depression or I want to fix my trigger Every time you engage in that ritual, whether it is a simple ritual like this that you do th you know, twice a day, three minutes each time, um, that ritual should be seeded with that intention. And that intention needs to be seeded in the right way. And there's a right language for that. You seed that intention every time you engage in that ritual. I meet many people, especially from the land that I come from, who are very ritualistic. And I'm being judgmental saying this, they're actually dogmatic. And the reason why they're dogmatic is because they don't understand the science of rituals. They just do a ritual because that's what their parents did. That's what their teachers did. That's what their community did. So let me also do this ritual every day. It is kind of just blind inheritance. But the ones that I meet who are awakened, who are aware, the way they do the rituals is they first, before they engage that ritual, they invoke the right intention and they hold that intention in their awareness and they do the ritual. And suddenly, that intention is not just a thought anymore. It becomes a vibration across your whole being. And when it becomes a vibration across your whole being, it becomes a vibration around you. And soon enough, that vibration turns into matter. It's a very advanced science, rituals. It's just that most people don't understand that science so they do rituals and they feel ridiculous themselves doing it because they don't understand the science. In most cases, they experience zero benefit from the rituals. In some cases, I know people. I know people. I can tell you the story of this one woman I know. This woman, she jumped into a, a bunch of rituals. Uh, without understanding and I must say Long story short as the months pass by Everyone around her were noticing that her condition was deteriorating She was becoming more and more disconnected from the world more and more disconnected with her own heart incapable of loving uh, becoming more aloof, 
uh, a difficult person to be with, etc., etc. And she persisted with that ritual. So I've even seen cases where rituals have done harm to people. So naturally, um, I can imagine when most people notice rituals are not yielding any results or in some cases even having adverse effect. Naturally, they'd say like, you know what, I'd rather just intellectualize things uh, and see, at least I understand what it means. And I don't want to go into the realm of rituals. Okay, switching gears. Mm -hmm. Should men show their vulnerability to women and why not? Hmm. Wow. You know, I'll touch upon a, some, uh, a more holistic part of it. That's chapter 14 in the book Mature Masculinity. Um, we have a responsibility as men to be fiercely authentic. It is a feminine that is people-centered. So, I see somebody suffering, somebody hurting, and the last thing the feminine within us feels is like, you know, uh, to broach bad news. Because oh, I understand that person's pain. I know what he or she is going through. Like, you know what? Let me not bring up the bad news. That is the inner feminine. The inner feminine is, feminine is people-centric. The inner masculine is principle-centered. And that means... If there is something that is core to you, a principle, you will stand by it, no matter what. You will be fiercely honest about it. And if that triggers somebody's wounds, so be it. You're not bringing it out because you want to see that person suffering in pain. No, you're doing that because you have this higher responsibility to show up in your mature masculine and that means fiercely authentic and that fierce authenticity applies to all emotions yes I'm feeling joyful I feel like dancing I feel like laughing and being authentic means just laughing just dancing just singing but also it is the same when it comes to the anger we feel and the fear we feel. Vulnerability, at least in this land, what I've learned from my minimal experiences, vulnerability is associated with uh, opening up to our fear and our pain. Are we able to, uh, to show up in that pain or in that fear? Um, if I'm somebody who's uh, who's committed to the practice of fear's authenticity, then yes. When I'm feeling joy, I'll show up in that joy. I'll, I'll give a hug. But if I'm feeling pain, I'll show up in that pain. And if that pain entails tears, doesn't matter how that's going to land with somebody. I will do justice to that pain by by being honest with him so is being vulnerable being authentic it's yes for me so um being i want to be authentic i will be vulnerable as i would be angry if, I'm, if my anger is triggered, as I would be laughing or dancing or hugging if I feel that joy or love. It's a practice of fierce authenticity. This concept of showing up 
gets mentioned regularly. What is that? Showing up. Showing up. Do you want to show up as authentic? Show up? Mm. I think I get a sense of what, what you're uh, raising. Uh, I meet people, I've met myself, uh, not showing up means uh, there was a part of my life where uh, I wasn't showing up. I had put on this mask for a big part of that phase. I didn't even know that I was having that mask. But um, I was conditioned to be in, in a certain role, to um, show up in a way that is pleasing, that is most harmonious, congenial to that life, to that society, to that environment. And I've done that. And a big part of that stage, I wasn't even aware that uh, I was not showing up as who I am. I was basically being the Mr. Nice Guy, putting on the right mask that will be appealing to the women around me, the men around me, to my teachers, uh, to my educators, to my relatives. Yeah. And... Uh, Showing up was something else. It was me dropping that mask and, and showing up as who I am, no matter what. Uh, and yes, I know people who have felt discomfort from me showing up as who I am. There are people I know who uh, um, left my life. But that's okay. That's all right. You know, because remember, even if I lost one or two, I found me. And I'm content with that. So uh, showing up for me is actually being who I am rather than... Uh, all that conditioned masks and filters and other people's expectations of who I ought to be. No, that's not for me. You bring up loss. How can men in a men's group help each other with loss? Mm. Uh, in a big way. Men's, I, I've been very privileged to be uh, in circles where very, um, very many times um, loss, that hurt, that grief of loss was healed. And um, the privilege I've had helping soldiers, I'll use that as an example. Um, um, They've seen loss. They've seen loss. And they've seen loss at their own hands. And that is extremely painful. You know, even when it is loss that they've created, they carry the, the, the hurt of that, the grief of that. The loss that they've experienced of fellow men or women who lost lives in battlefields. Um, the love that they've lost. So, all that wound that they carry and that pain is so alive that they are not able to function like others who have not experienced those traumas can. Um, and yet, when they come into a men's group or a retreat or anything that I would facilitate, one of the extremely important parts for them to do is to revisit that pain, reconfront that loss, 
re-engage that trauma and relive. And sometimes it can be a very horrifying sight. Because there's so much pain inside. That pain is so intense that they scream and they beat the earth and they throw themselves and there is so much pain and they feel that safety only uh, in a good brotherhood to fully boldly confront it re-engage it and scream and sob and 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 grab the earth and to go through that process of grieving you know beating their chest and banging their heads they need to go through that and the good thing is they know that they are in the council of strong men in devoted service to their cause they feel safe they feel not judged they feel uh, protected and they pass through that grief. They go through, they, they open up to that loss. And when they've done that and gone through that, when they could rest it and come to the realization that yes, uh, loss happens, it's a law of nature, that uh, um, there is a lesson in it for them that makes them stronger, wiser, more inspirational. That a loss is not in the subjective sense a loss. That at some form or some level that it's all still there. All those loved ones are around us. And once they start realizing all of that, they, uh, they start becoming okay. And are you saying it's less likely that that would happen if there are women present? I don't know. I cannot speak to that. Well, but you advocate that men go to men's, men yes. only groups. Yeah. Why? Um, right? So you I cannot speak of the inverse. It is a piece of wisdom that I grew up with. And for 30 years, it has proved right. I know that for myself. That uh, when I have a sacred brotherhood around me, it is powerful, it's profound, it is life transforming. Now, would somebody be able to create that uh, for men in the council of other women? That is not exactly what I, the understanding that I've grown up with. Um, if somebody is able to do that, I'd say, well done. What I do know, I'm a very simple person that way. There's a part of women's work, inner work, that they can complete only in the council of other women. That women can only complete in the... Yes. There's a, a very crucial part of women's inner work that can be completed only in the council of other women. Sisterhood. Not just any woman because any woman can be as damaging as any man. Mm -hmm. So, I mean awakened women. And that is the principle behind sacred sisterhoods. Um, what I know, by virtue of my mystical tradition, my own life experiences, this very foundational piece of masculine, the mature masculine reawakening, it is something that uh, must be done in the council 
of other awakened men. Are there things that only women can do for men? Mm. Absolutely. Only a mother can be a mother. Mm. I mean in the motherhood sense. Mm. Um, so, yes. It's kind of an obvious one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Having said that, you know, it is... The feminine has gotten, in, and I'm not talking about man and woman, I'm talking about the masculine and feminine. The feminine has got such an incredibly important role in our journey because if we are aware, we will notice that um, through the reactions of awakened of the feminine, awakened women, women who are grounded in their feminine, through the reactions of the feminine, we know exactly how congruent or incongruent we are with the inner masculine. They are the greatest mirror, as the masculine is the greatest mirror for the feminine. So, nobody can give that self-awareness of who we are being than the feminine and vice versa. That is the dance of the masculine and the feminine. So yes, to kind of expand your question, the feminine has got a, 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 a crucial, inescapable a role in our growth right from being born. What does this relationship look like between a mature masculine man and a mature feminine woman? <laughs> oh, that's a very, very difficult question to verbally express. But uh, you have You'll come to the, the, the enlightened relationship retreat. And that enlightened relationship retreat, the substance of that retreat is all about this. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, it's about that dance that can happen between the masculine and the feminine, the mature masculine and the mature feminine. And trying to put that in words. Yeah, because this is kind of abstract. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's energetic. It's also abstract. Yeah. It's uh, not very straightforward for me. Okay, well, that. let's look at simple things. Uh, <laughs> mature masculine man comes home from work. His mature feminine woman might also come home from work. And... There is a disagreement. Mm. What is different in this couple as opposed to a couple where it's an immature masculine mm. and feminine? Wow. You know, um, in my my relationship with Camilla, um, there are often disagreements. She's a woman. Her inner reality, her approach to the world is so different than mine. And naturally, by virtue of that, the way she would look at the world, it's, it's, uh, um, we would have disagreements. You know, she would have a different view, I'd have a different view. And that's, that's okay. That's all right. Where, um, it starts getting bad is uh, how we relate to our different worldviews. Uh, in, in our case, we 
have prioritized the practice of acceptance over agreement. We don't try to force each other to persuade you to compromise and come to some kind of an adjustment where both are unhappy. No. I simply accept the fact that she feels this way about something and I feel that way about something. And... Uh, It's fine. We practice acceptance. And uh, we don't squabble over it. We don't argue about it uh, because I don't feel any need to persuade her to accept the way I feel. No. Um, it's uh, we just respect each other for each other's sovereignty, and that works well for us. We don't try to argue over it. We don't try to uh, manipulate each other and persuade each other to to convince each other. We don't do that. We simply hold space. But, uh, okay, I hear you. I, I, I understand this, how you feel, so thank you, that's it. And that is for us, uh, our practice of uh, the mature masculine and the mature feminine relating to each other. Can I get a, a bit more personal? Sure. When do you feel least masculine? When do I feel least masculine mm. when I'm overloaded and too much into the doing mode of life and so burdened that uh, I become unaware. You know, between Kamila and I, you know, you of course you know that we don't have a car, but uh, very often when I'm on tour, uh, we rent a car, or when we are in Europe, you know, Italy becomes our home, and then her in her family there are cars. In India, our friends have got cars, so we when we use cars. It is something that is, you know, I like to open the door for her. Not because she doesn't have two arms for that. No, you know what? That is me feeling my strength, my power, and putting that power in service of her. I like it. I feel in my masculine doing that. And for the seven years we've known each other, that's, that's a practice that has always continued. I like it, she likes it. But there's been one or two occasions where I was so much in my head, so preoccupied, so burdened down by the doingness of life. There, there's been uh, one or two occasions where I uh, completely forgot. And then she would hold me to account. I kind of like run, I open the door, I sit in the car, I put my seat belt and then I see she's not there, she's standing there. And then I pull out my seat, seat belt, run over to the other side, open the door, uh, seat her in and then come back. So she would hold me to account. And that is again, immediately I get reminded like, you know what? No, I need to subtract. I need to subtract now, you know, I'm getting too pulled into the doingness of life. No, that's not me. I don't like that. I'm not the, the kind of person that if you, if there are too many things, then uh, I would uh, become quite fierce in just like, no, that's it. It doesn't matter who it is. It can be the, the prime minister of this land. No, 
I'll simply like yeah, yeah. Cause uh, I don't. That's I'm not being my true self in in the in the quantum of that doingness. And and those are also situations where, under the burden of that, I uh, I am least in my masculine. If I'm in a men's group and I feel anger towards one of the other men, mm. it's possible that I'm actually angry at that man, mm. or that I'm this man is representing something, something else. Mm. How do you find out which of the two it is? Mm. Wow, that's more a. Uh... A psychological question than a mystical one. Um, but if it is any of any help, Christian, um, what we recognize, and if I literally translate from my language, what we understand is, it's not that I am angry, it is I have anger. That is literally how we recognize that energy. And the good thing about it is, suddenly um, the responsibility for that anger is with me. My anger is with me. I have anger. And yes, somebody can trigger me through whatever he said or however he looks or behaves it can all be triggers um, as we've already discussed before you know in our sake in the sacred brotherhoods of my tradition there is this one code and that is you know we never confront each other or hold each other accountable unless that person explicitly asks me. Like, you know, Sujit, I'm sensing something that I, I said is making you angry. Um, would you like to share, speak about it, or share that, whatever. Unless that explicit permission comes from an empowered place, you know, there's no question of challenging, holding each other accountable, psychoanalyzing, nothing. Um, that's one thing. Um, recognizing uh, that it's my anger. Something else that's extremely valuable when it comes to brotherhoods is, you know, I have anger and, you know, I feel safe. In that space even if I haven't received permission to share it with the person who triggered that anger you know, it's only a trigger remember it's not that that person is responsible for my anger that person triggered my anger and even if I haven't received explicit permission from that person for me to channel my anger towards that person in our tradition the brotherhood gives, is a space, a sacred space where you can just like we've seen some of the men do in the last weekend, you can just reconnect with that anger in your own way, whether it is through screaming, through shouting, through haka, whatever it is, because it helps reconnecting with it, releasing that anger and then from an altered awareness, be able to look at each other. So just the fact, I even remember there was a, a, one occasion where this man, he carried so much anger from all the defeats of life and the injustices of modern life and and I remember in this case uh, in this man's case the system um, let him down because he was going through a separation and all that and it, it was amusing it's actually from this land how 
tragically uh, prejudiced um, um, the system was towards his separation. It was prejudiced. And I may not know the full story, but the way he laid out the events, the, the different facts, the men sitting there, they were like, I mean, this seems factual. Why would they say no? But, and, and you can imagine his pain, his frustration, the anger, the resentment, everything inside. And there came a moment where he just stood up, took his own stick, and he started beating the trees for a good five minutes. Total wildness. The stick broke into pieces. It was flying all over the place. There was sweat and spit. At the end of it, he found a very tranquil place. A place of awareness. From which and I still remember he said at the end of at, and then he said something like, you know what? I'm going to make this. He said two things. Uh, I'm trying to remember. One he said was like, I'm going to make this a compassionate separation. And uh, everything that she wants, I'll say yes to it. If she wants to be a lesser person, that's her choice. That is not going to equate to who I am. And I'm going to approach this whole process with compassion. If it's going to make her happy, whatever she's going to ask, I'm going to say yes. That was one of the things he said. The second thing he said was about the system or something. Like, you know what? I recognize uh, the system is prejudiced against me, against men, and that's okay. That is a reflection of the consciousness of our society than of my own greatness. So you know what? It is They are the ones who should be losing sleep because of who they are, not me. I am who I am, and I'll be in my greatness. I forgive the system. He spoke that out to the fire. And uh, that was the moment of truth for him. He stood there shaking, tears, all the other men. But in that moment, in that liberation from his anger, he found his truth. And that truth set him free. Thereafter, he lost some money, you know, because the system is only about uh, inequity of material. But instead what he gained was his kingdom. And he got that by simply taking that his own stick, his carved stick, five minutes and releasing his anger in the safety of that brotherhood. That's all it took. He didn't have to channel it or confront each other for that. He just freed himself and his greatness shone. Thank you, Surjit. For sitting in this sauna with me. Wow. Well, yeah, thank you. you know, it's a... Uh, you know that that is a good that was a yeah thank you for bringing that last question up so i guess that's a very touchy subject around here touchy for me it is one of the beauties of men's group to see what can be done with anger and to explore anger instead of with society where i i cannot be angry here oh. i can't Yes. They will call the police. Yes. You will be in jail. Yeah. 
Holland a little bit more acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, there is, there are answers there. Yeah. Uh, and as you just described, how just the release. Yeah. Never mind the psychology, the new thoughts, the conclusions. Just the release of hi of hitting that tree. Yeah. Can really can 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 free someone from whatever's holding them back. Yeah. And I am always for making space for that in a men's group. And that's one of the reasons why I am for provoking men, mm. if they're open to that. Mm. And poking, as we talked about. Mm. Yeah. Because if it's, if it's kept in sight, they may not realize that there is any anger. And so they will not voluntarily release it. So to accelerate the mm. release is one of the things that a managed group can do. Yeah. And so I'm for that. You know, uh, if I may, um, poking thing aside, you know, like we saw this last weekend, uh, there is something very powerful we can do. And that is showing up in our grace, our depth. And you see how that starts opening up everyone to fear, to sadness, to anger, everything. Because that's the power of brotherhoods. I mean, that is a power of any sacred group. That when I throw open my heart, everyone joins. And suddenly, like, you know, in your story, I'll find my story. Or in somebody else's anger, I'll find my anger. And it, it just kind of mutually reinforces, the opening of hearts just mutually reinforces after that. And that is, there is some leadership uh, there. We can just uh, uh, be the change we want to see. And that is really the, the kind of premise that in my sacred brotherhoods, uh, at mine, I meant, my, in my tradition. Um, there is a, a focus on that standard. So if I host a group, I keep that in mind, that, that, um, that the sharing of one man can pave the road for another man to start sharing and opening up as well. And so I would always check in first mm -hmm. if I host to assist where I can in setting the right tone. Beautiful. But I don't see you do that. In what sense? That you, you ask the other man to share, mm -hmm. but you don't first share yourself. You shared in this whole weekend, you, sh you shared one thing about your father. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you mm. did. Yeah. I love that question. I love that observation, actually. You know, uh, there, there is enormous leadership in facilitation. So the space we created the leadership I gave to it is showing up in my authenticity. I don't have a lot of sadness in my life, uh, God's grace, at least at this moment. Uh, most of the things that gets expressed around me are okay by me. Um, 
the leadership I provide to a space like that is uh, my authenticity, whoever I am. If I have sadness or anger or joy or just simple grace of being fully present in service. Um, and you notice that's contagious. People take that as permission to go on their own journey. So in that sense, yes, I am incapable uh, because I don't have a lot of anger inside me. God's grace today. I don't have much anger inside me. Uh, there are not a lot of things that make me sad. So there isn't a lot I can bring that way. But there's plenty I can bring through my own authenticity in that space by uh, bringing my own grace into that space. And they, they automatically go deeper, just showing up in that depth. And each one's journey was completely different. For some, the, the journey was that one young man, his journey was all about anger, anger. Remember, every time he would share, he would speak about anger. For one of the older gentlemen, we know it was all sadness, completely separate journey. Um, for one of the other older men, it was just deep confusion. And they went on their own journey. It was all us. We were all in a collective journey, which was still very personal. The common denominator was this depth. And that depth, as a facilitator or host, as you put it, is a very powerful leadership that we can offer. And in the trainings also that I offer for men who want to uh, start their own brotherhoods, I repeat this, that starting a brotherhood, a big part of starting a brotherhood is inner work. How capable am I to show up as in my own depth? Because that is precisely the awareness at which the brotherhood will work. If I would come up, I, I, if I would show up as a facilitator or host in that circle, and this is true for every circle, not just a brotherhood. If I'm going to show up in a deeply analytical way, everyone will mimic it. If I would show up in a very superficial way, that is where everyone will stay. That collective energy will stay at that level. Um, if you will, if I will show up with heartbreaking sadness, you will notice that they will all step into that same energy field. If I choose to show up in depth, you will notice they'll all respond. For some, it might be difficult, you know, as you noticed on day one. There were a couple of men who were aloof. You, they were seeing around them all these men plunge into the depth. But then there were a couple of men who were kind of hesitant, um, reserved. Day two, they all felt safe. They all felt normal to be deep and I had a role to play in it because I'm a facilitator. I have to embody that energy that I want to see in that space. Knowing that everybody's journey is very different, you know, seven billion people, everybody's journey is different. So there's so much leadership in that facilitation. We do. Seven yes. Twenty. Okay. Here goes lane one on the left. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here it is.
was a whole motorcycle squad there. Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of immense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, very much. Very much. They might not be able to articulate it, that experience, as elegantly of, as most other men who are part of formal men's groups. But uh, that is such a powerful brotherhood. You can, you can see that you know, many of these biker groups and all that that I've, I've come across, there's this incredible sense of solidarity to oneself. Yeah. And yeah. All for one, yeah. one for all. And the way they, they, they relate to each other, well, absolutely. So we might say that the biker group is a bastardized version of a men's group, and they might say that the men's group is a bastardized version <laughs> of a biker group. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's um, um, the, the, the biker groups that I know that are extremely private, and the few people that I've met it's incredible. They they don't have any judgment towards the rest of us, mm. men or women mm. in society. Mm. Yeah. They, um, I've had many men who would simply just say like, you know what, they live their life, we live ours. And that's a tremendous attitude. So, uh, but yes, there is something uh, very inspiring about that energetic presence in many of these biker group men. Okay, get a few more experience card there. Okay. Okay, now so in a in a men's group um, you get to process things yourself. You get to have support uh, while processing things and exploring things and taking distance from things. But you also get to witness others going through that process. What is the value of that? Very, very much. Very, very much. It's, uh, uh, however old we are in life, we are constantly learning, consciously or unconsciously. Even, you know, like I had um, last December, in the men's leadership walk, the eight-day walk that I do, last December, the oldest man, a Dutchman, the oldest man who joined was a uh, eight-year-old, eight days, a rough terrain, and he was so instrumental, a man with one eye, he was so instrumental in our own learning, just by by observing this man take on life, shed that conditioned skin and um, uh, make that leadership walk. There's something about it that was absolutely educative for all the other men. And of course, towards the end, when we do the checking out, the closing ceremony, it's incredible the, the lessons he was learning that he picked up from the other men. And this at 80 years old. And then you discover like, yes, you know, um, to your point that yes, we are constantly learning. Um, from our environment, consciously or unconsciously. And uh, in that setting, because you go through such a, a fiercely intimate process, what is expressed in that experience is this, this mature masculine essence. So there are a dozen men in their mature masculine eight days together there is imagine what we are learning from each other we're just learning to be the greatest we can be so um absolutely in, and even on this continent you know where there um 
men and women are increasingly more individualistic than uh, my tradition which is very very collectivistic even here even when we believe that you know I am on my own and I have to learn through my own life experiences even here we are constantly uh, picking up uh, cues and and healthy or unhealthy wisdom from uh, each other absolutely and uh, and and the unique thing about good men's groups are you're pretty much almost always a witness of breakthroughs these are men like the stories as you know like you know, um, who come and they are angry with their former wife because of situations that happened and this and that and uh, you notice a few weeks or a few months later they are able to sit there and send their prayers and express their compassion for the same people who've hurt them how often can we see those kind of breakthroughs and those breakthroughs um, in, in the groups that I've been part of often happen when they finally feel safe to express anger oh yeah I mean all the 50 you know in in my mystical tradition we've identified 50 different um, I, my reservation yes, yes. Phone number. Uh, 604 Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, we recognize 50, 50, 50 um, inner states which are of lower vibration. Whether it is anger, fear, guilt, shame rage, I mean envy, um, all of that, it is 50 of them and yes, if we can uh, uh, get intimate with all of that, well at least the bigger ones like anger and fear, what an incredible uh, healing that is. But there's something puzzling about that. These men feel the safety to finally be angry. But why is it so scary to be angry? Ah. Well, good question. You know, it's um, and this is true for both the East and the West, uh, Christian. Like it or not, most of us, men and women, children, we feel the the diktat, the conditioning, the norms, the pressures of society. We do. Imagine you are alone living on an island. Are you going to feel any filters to expressing your anger? Something happens, you'll probably just express it. And the good thing is um, If there's any judgment, uh, bear with me. Um, uh, many of the Oriental and Middle Eastern cultures, you will notice uh, anger being more freely expressed, much more. It's not that um, they are more angry people or they're more triggered. No, it is just that uh, there, 
there are less social norms or social filters or uh, diktats against not expressing. So it is, um, yeah, if you are angry, um, there is somebody whose judgment is there or there is somebody else calling 911 or this or that or our mothers telling us it is not okay to be angry. There is a system that is um, it's a very toxic system because um, it is the same anger. Did you read the news yesterday? No. Uh, Philippines casino some angry man man with so much anger inside just goes kills more than 30 people not because he's met any of those 30 people there's a good chance he probably doesn't know any of them just kills so is good chances is none of them may have ever hurt him in his life but he carries hurt inside and he would go and do it. And this is categorically what happens when we try to box these lower vibrations in men. And many of the Western lands that I visit to, there's extremely very little tolerance towards women or men connecting with any of the lower vibrations, whether it is anger, fear, guilt, shame, no, it is uh, frowned upon, condemned uh, and that is very very unhealthy because fear just perpetuates more fear, anger just perpetuates more fear and more anger inside and around. So uh, in that sense men's group suddenly become this disruptor of that that way that orbit that system extremely powerful I'm a as you know I truly believe that maybe 80% maybe even higher than that of all the men related problems that we hear about in the media, the statistics that we hear, all of that can be healed, wiped clean with just having proper, healthy, uh, well set up brotherhoods. You say Eighty. all, all of that, or many, most of that, a lot of that. Yeah, very, very many of them. The like, world would be a better place if everyone would be... Infinitely. Okay. Infinitely, you know. Many of the young men I meet in prisons, um, the men who have uh, depression, uh, suicidal tendencies, um, men who have anger issues, um, uh, situations with... Um, um, relational dysfunctions, um, uh, professional challenges. All of that. You know, having proper, well founded, you know, brotherhoods founded based on the right standards. So extremely healing. Now, I, I assume you're familiar with uh, ego defense mechanisms. Ego defense. Help me understand. So we have those things that you call lo the lower vibration hmm. uh, neural tissues. Hmm. But they, we're not always aware of those, so they may come out in very different ways. 
in denial or there are he healthy ones like sublimation uh, or people just to outsiders it usually just looks like people, someone is acting weird hmm. and it would indicate that there would be one of those uh, what you call the lower vibrations so, uh, conditionings hmm. but they're not the, the person himself or herself is not aware of it hmm. and then it comes out in a different way hmm. is <coughs> a men's group also a good place to somehow poke someone to to bring that out <laughs> Ah, I love this. I think we've kind of at least energetically touched upon this on previous occasions. I have uh, I have encountered in my life two different views towards this. In uh, particularly on this continent, you know, some of the men's groups um, I've uh, connected with. One of the active standards there is um, uh, that every man, every brother, every man in the men's group has permission to poke each other when they see uh, the the need to do so. In uh, my mystical tradition, we we don't do that. It's not an active standard. We don't. Um, we don't poke each other. No. We hold a sacred space for each other. And there is no active standard of poking each other. Um, when I want to be poked, then I explicitly give permission to others to poke me otherwise there is nothing like raising my hand when somebody needs to be poked or I think according to my mental model think oh this man he needs to be poked so I raise my hand you know what okay when you're done I want to poke you it is a it's a recognition that you know you are on a perfect path at this moment and we don't have to collectively be at the same place same stage in our growth but we can collectively hold each other as sacred hold each other as um, perfect in his journey and when when the time comes, that person will, uh, at his own terms, the person will, uh, will come to his moment of truth. And um, very often, very often, you know, the greatest openings happen by just being in that shared space of journey. So we, um, poking each other based on my mental model is uh, not at all an active standard in uh, the, the brotherhoods of my tradition. But you just brought up an event from the news where <clears throat> somebody shot 30 people in a casino. That man probably also didn't bring out his issues voluntarily so if someone would have poked him maybe that would have you know maybe if you poke him in the right place maybe instead of anger tears come out oh absolutely and then the anger doesn't you know i don't know if i'm not mistaken he ended his life uh, uh in that massacre uh yesterday now you know, he's isolated. He's a rare case when it comes to taking such drastic action. But when it comes to 
that vibration, that anger, that hurt that is inside, that is that is true for most men that I meet, and I mean on four continents. That is that condition, that that inner state of having those hurts, those wounds, that anger, that fear, anxiety, whatever. That is the 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 story of most. Uh, adult men today and um, there is a very very powerful way in which I can poke many of these men and that is by showing up in my own authentic essence which very often now like now we are going to be with 20 men booked out um, it is not for majority of them is not the words that they read about something that inspired them to join us it is somehow this propagating energy of the practice I do and worldwide there are about 4 million people in my network that's connected with me whether through men's work whether through relationship work whether through leadership work um, four million people and uh, I can poke them or I may have poked them but that poking is one of um, showing up in your authentic manner and that is extremely contagious. It is it's incredible how far and wide the travels. And then suddenly it's not one or two people that you actively poke. Kind of without even knowing. There's this incredible spread that happens. Like, you know, there are about 45, according to last count, 45 men's groups that I have either launched or somehow I've been supportive or instrumental in launching. And this is on four continents. And they, and, and some of these men are continuing to practice with me because I feel this longing to want to pass on the, the wisdom and the practices of my mystical tradition, the men's work of my mystical tradition. And somehow, these men, not because they were poked by me, but poked by life in itself, they somehow find their calling. And at some point, they discover that, you know, my inner journey, my inner work is not separate from his inner work or her. her. We are all collective in this journey. And then they feel like, you know what? I want to start my men's group. Some of them have actually started mixed groups now. It's, it's there. There's one gentleman in Belgium. But there's no real... And I, I believe that active poking in the, the social settings we live in only closes people up. What about challenging? Good question. You know, Tristan, if I would tell you, like, you know, I'm going to challenge you. Mm -hmm. You see, I already made you in an awareful state mm -hmm. and then challenge you. Um, that is not the reality for 99.9 .9 people, a percent of the people. Right? Um, I would just go there and do this. Who knows? I might get beaten up, even shot mm -hmm. in places. You know, it's... Um, I'm not saying I'm against challenging. 
I'm saying that, you know, um, that it must be, the challenge must be sought by me or you on our own terms. That I must be, however dysfunctional or damaged or hurt or wounded I am, I am in my driving seat. And that sacred standard, um, if we lose sight of that, then we end up actually, you know, based on our mental model of what is good for somebody or society, we actually disempower people. So, yeah, I'll join you guys. Yeah. So, um, there again, you know, this is how I feel. We must, um, I'm sure when you want to be challenged, you are already an awakened man. You know under what terms you want to be challenged. You will ask. You will ask. Yet, you didn't reach that this state of awakeness overnight. It has been through a journey that you undertook. And uh, we simply should create that condition for each uh, man and woman, but man in particular, to, um, to come to that stage of awakeness, just on their own terms, holding it sacred that they are leaders of their life. Very valuable, because not only are we gaining in that process a wholesome man, we are gaining an incredibly inspiring self-leader. And I have many, many, many examples to share. You have four prerequisites for the men's group. Fire, barefooted. Ah, yeah. You know, um, there are more than four uh, prerequisites. I'm trying to look for a, a translation uh, of the word. Um, there are more four accompanying spirits. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they are indeed one always in my mystical tradition it is done with uh, men's groups sacred brotherhoods are organized with fire as a witness um, uh, ourselves in deep connection with the sky so we do it outdoors so that we are in connection with the sky because that represents all our forefathers our ancestors our source energy our uh, our mysticism, our lineage, our heritage, extremely important. It is most of the troubles I, I notice, and I'm being judgmental saying this, most of the troubles I notice among men living in the Western lands is coming out of this disconnection from their own source energy. And um, the source energy, this connection with our forefathers and ancestors and our mysticism and all of that is not tangible. So for the Western mind, it is not as significant as it is for the more Eastern minds or the more indigenous minds. Um, we recognize it's extremely, extremely important to have that connection all the time with the source energy. So. Part of your source energy is your Dutchness. You are uh, you are a Dutchman. That's part of who you are. Doesn't matter whether you're going to live, continue living your life in Canada or U.S. or wherever it is. Um, for you 
to fully step into your your greatness all of who you are you can never disown that dutchness uh it is it is an essential part of the energy that tristan is and that cannot be disqualified so we need to be outdoors that is actually invoking the presence of our source energy and then it must be a uh, bare feet and at the edge of civilization um going away from civilization um very 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 valuable very valuable simply because space has got consciousness space has got a certain culture a certain maturity all space whether is your home your workplace whether it is a city and when we retreat from that space we are retreating from that consciousness like um, and it's extremely important like one of the western sages albert einstein like he said we can never fix a problem at the same level of consciousness at which the problem exists he's a wise man and um, us going into wilderness is because there is that primordial nature within man man the masculine that is the primordial nature is the same nature as that wilderness and um, when we step into that that nature or wilderness we are automatically um, evoking that energy within the self so absolutely very valuable uh, accompaniment maybe maybe that's a good word for accompaniments for men's work so uh, the fire as a witness which is the portal between the physical and the non physical the the material and the immaterial the outdoors mm -hmm. so that we have the connection with the uh, source energy bare feet so that we are connected to earth earth is considered the the energy of the feminine and uh, yeah outdoors uh, wilderness super valuable Yeah. Thanks, Vijit. Shall we go? Yeah, don't forget your mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's... um Talking of this... Um, talking of... Um, all the things unfolding. Um, thanks to all the great gifts tour begins. And then uh, at the end of the world tour, uh, oh, uh, August my world tour begins at the end of the world tour. After we finish uh, Asia Pacific and all that, uh, end of February, we'll not be returning to Vancouver. We'll not be returning to Vancouver as, we will be returning to Vancouver to continue this incredible practice with all these women and men and all this beautiful work and this dear loving friends spending time with them and celebrating life but Vancouver as home uh, will cease to exist in our life we uh, Malta has found us uh, is it also about shedding another skin? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. You know, like I earlier said, um, uh, Tristan, it's, uh, uh, you know, when I set out to fully own this work, this practice, there were no specific goals or roadmap 
of like, you know what, I want to go out and reach out and touch one million people's lives or I want to write these books or have 50, 40, 45 uh, brotherhoods, nothing like that. It was basically like, I want to continue my life as one long practice without compartmentalizing. Oh, you know, this is my relationship life. So I do, I perform it. This is my professional life. I perform it. And then away from all of that, I'll do my own spiritual practice. Now, it was basically like, you know, I want every moment of my life to just be that deeply fulfilling practice and perhaps because I did not have any goals and deliverables and roadmap and objectives and all that you know there are like almost 4 million people connected um, to my life to my practice and um, that has kind of drawn me more and more into this the doing doingness of life doing life. and uh, this cycle has been extremely intense and uh, I was, I'm extremely fortunate of course to have Adi and Camilla who are two incredible champions of everything that I'm doing my practice for myself and your son and your wife yeah and and countless men and they've traveled with me on these world tours every year over and over again for the last seven years and uh, and now a time is coming for my little son to find the stability the physical stability to go to school to have that that routine and uh, so two years ago I had really set that intention to to come clear on uh, what that step is going to look like and again here is where these brotherhoods have helped me every land I visit there's a brotherhood there's at least one that is kind of resonant with my heart with my mystical traditions um, and I can just join there and many of these brothers are so considerate when they hear that I'm in that land, they actually have a brotherhood together. They'll have a, a session. And we would spend a day in the wilderness, whatever. And all these spaces, being with the, in the presence of uh, uh, these men in these sacred settings, have helped accelerate this thinking of, you know, where is that next step going to be? And uh, somehow Malta has expressed and uh, it feels right, though it was not the outcome of a logical process like, OK, I need to be in, in this place from where I can fly easily or I need to be in a place where, uh, you know, um, Adya is close to his uh, source energy. No, it just has come together pretty much on its own. And now when I use my limited logical mind and connect the dots, I'm like, wow, it's beautiful. It feels right. It is a very slow island. And um, I'm, I'm for the next stage, I'm ready for that. I'm ready to retreat a little bit, to become more of a, a, a little bit more of a recluse and uh, embody a more minimalistic life closer to nature so we will a, a farmhouse will find us in Malta where I can grow some fruits and vegetables and and, and be bare feet uh, all day long and put my hands in the dirt and from Malta to fly anywhere in the world is super easy and Europe is central in the sense that uh, from there to fly to North America or to fly to Asia Pacific is so easy eight hours I'm in a different continent feels right for Adia he's so much closer to his source energies of Italy and India um, it just looking back and connecting the dots it just feels like wow so uh, 
that is a big new physical step happening so we won't return a final uh, last question hmm. you've told me in a conversation earlier that on Malta there's this mountain and you can see the entire you can see everything from that mountain the whole island mountains mountains you yeah okay it's kind of like almost barren yeah. And then you can see like, you know, there there is a hill, there there is a hill, another five kilometers up front there is a hill. So, like mm, few kilometers uh, apart from each other, there are these mounds mm. sticking out. And the, the medieval towns are built on top of the mountains. And you just go to the, the, the town wall and you can see the ocean on all four sides. Now those points where you can see everything. In a man's life, what is that point? Wow. Help me understand more the question. Well, the image I got from when you described it is that, that there's one point, or as you say, several points. Mm. But for the sake of this question, let's, let's say there's one point where you, you can climb on that mountain, and from that mountain you can see everything. Mm. In a man's journey, what is that? Ah. You know, if I if I look at my own life, and this is true for any being, um, I've journeyed life for a while, passaging, and then I'll have this stage of arrival, arrival in clarity, where life feels so clear every aspect of it my personal life my professional pursuits my own inner world the how i show up in communities all aspects of life and lifestyle becomes clear it feels like yes here i am on top of a mountain where everything is clear when i look around and then i start living that clarity and then the evolution continues. The passaging begins again. And again, there is fogginess. But now I've kind of reached a stage where uh, I recognize that fogginess is just an indication of the passaging phase. And I need to continue passaging. And brotherhoods are extremely important to support that passaging because it is a it is a stage of surrender, it's a stage of not knowing, a stage of confusion, inner chaos, impatience, frustration, all of that. And eventually even resignation, like, ha, oh, I don't know what to do with this. But all that passaging is so, there's no better resource for a man than to have sacred brotherhoods to support that passage and then poof again one day clarity comes up you know what i see myself on mainland i see myself spending time doing something that is extremely important to me because you know i love it it helps me step into full potential whether it's videography or men's work or whatever I see myself in this kind of a relationship. I see my lifestyle being so and so. That clarity suddenly comes and you notice yourself being on top of the mountain. But then again, it's transient. It's just a matter of time when that fog reappears. And then we are out again, headed out on passage. And maybe the next mound will come up. If we have a brotherhood, in my case, I've been extremely fortunate that the passagings have been comparatively shorter in my life compared to the lives of many men I know. And a lot of that credit I can give to these sacred brotherhoods that uh, I've been lucky to be part of. So yeah, the metaphor of uh, that mountaintop, who knows, maybe one year from now, I might be speaking with you and saying like, you know what, Tristan, I'm not on that mountaintop anymore at this moment. 
it's time for a new poof. Could be, and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, where I'm today in my life, you know, I feel like 45. I am. I feel like uh, I'm more comfortable with uh, the ebbs and flows of life and uh, whatever is waiting to express. I have this deep realization that there is a, a higher design to it. That even when I cannot wrap it with my limited intellect, it's okay. It is there is some higher good waiting to happen. So uh, the passaging doesn't uh, ruffle me that much. But indeed, it is a good metaphor, <laughs> the mountaintop. <laughs>